Let me give you some other examples. St. John's work as an antidepressant. Um, 10, 12 years ago, you would have found hardly anybody in the herb world. In fact, nobody in England, maybe, maybe some people here, few people in Germany, but not very many, who would have said you, you could use St. John's wort as an antidepressant. What we were using it for was, in, in the language, it was a trophorestorative for um, the nervous system, a wonderful tonic, a, um, anti-inflammatory for the nervous system, a wound healer for the nervous system, and a very useful uh, anxiolytic, um, good relaxing nervine. As soon as the first paper came out from Germany about, um, you know, n actually not very dramatic findings, but enough to be slightly sig statistically significant in mild to moderate depression, whatever that is, a um, whole bunch of herbalists in this country started using St. John's Wort as an antidepressant. And you can ask just about anybody in this conference, and most people in the street, what St. John's Wort is about, and they'll say an antidepressant. What happened? Why did we do that? It may help mild to moderate depression because it's an anxiolytic. Raise the spirits by e easing the depression. If you really want a more focused antidepressant herb that isn't moving into weird chemistry, um, think about the Artemisias. Go for a bitter. But that's a whole other class. My point is, we have allowed, in the St. John's work case, we've allowed ourselves to be manipulated out of the insights our body of knowledge has by news reports, by um, the people in the street learning this. And if they heard it from the news, then maybe it's true. I mean, we should know by now if it's on the news, it's disinformation. Do, do any of you remember it was a bad, there was hardly any news that week, and suddenly, all over the place, St. John's work was going to stop um, contraceptive pills working. Um, based, that was based on a little bit of laboratory information. St. John's work contains constituents which do affect the enzymes which do metabolize um, the birth control pill. And theoretically, it could be a problem. But St. John's Wort is one of the most widely used herbs in Central and Northern Europe and has been for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Used at really quite high levels for a whole range of things. If there was any clinical reality to St. John's Wort affecting um, contraceptive use, the German epidemiologists would have identified it years ago. But a, a scientist, a toxicologist said, danger. Um, you can't do that with drugs. You have to find a bit of science to hint at a problem, and then you have to marry that with clinical findings and epidemiological findings before you act on it. When it comes to herbalism, all it seems to need is a scientist to make a statement, and we back off. Terrible mistake. Because it leads to things like red clover. Now, red clover, in all the books, going way back in, in Europe, is just the flowering head. Again, about 10 years ago, and this was for purely commercial reasons, what started to appear in the marketplace, this is at the retail level, I'm not talking about wholesale large amounts, but retail level, was red clover tops. Well, herb, actually, the, the, it was about half leaves and stems and half um, flowering top. No one in, West, in, in European herbalism has ever written down the use of that combination. So these days with students at the California School of Herbal Studies, where I, I teach when this comes up, they're totally surprised that red clover doesn't have leaves in it. All the herbalists who knew this when this was going on, hardly any of us raised it as an issue. It just sort of slipped through. We should be ashamed of ourselves. That was a really bad thing to let happen. Black cohosh, um, again, a bit like St. John's work. Most people, if they know anything about herbs, now know that semisifuge black cohosh 
is a phytoestrogen. Actually, it's not, but that, that's a different point. But what they know about is the research done in Germany about the use of black cohosh as a gynecological remedy. How many people here know that one of its older names was rheumatism root? Just we all should. Um, its gynecological uses are really important, but what's happening is with remifenin and, and other products being given um, the attention they're given where the indications are really skewed by, by the manufacturers, a whole part of our tradition is being lost and forgotten about in front of our faces. And if any community is going to stop that happening, it's going to be us. It has to be us. Um, David made the point earlier on today about sorpalmito or however it should be pronounced. Um, we, we're now used to it as this, um, actually I've seen books and heard teachers describe it as a male tonic. No, it, it's being used in those lipophilic extracts for a very specific pharmacological end, which is just one part of a whole spectrum of things the plant could do. A spectrum of things that the Seminole Indians knew all about the eclectics knew all about, and we should know all about it. We don't. We've allowed that to slip. We, we can get it back. So my concern here is that our body of knowledge is being co-opted and subverted, and then it leads to the next step that, well, you don't really need herbs because they don't work well enough because, you know, St. John's wort is just this antidepressant. It's not a very good one, so throw away the St. John's wort. It's a slippery slope that leads us straight into um, the clutches of the pharmaceutical industry. And the changes which I see happening in the herb industry at the end of the 20th beginning of the 21st century, exactly mirror 19th century, 20th century changes. All of the modern drug companies, with the exception of the genetic engineering ones, but all of the other ones, started out as herb companies in the um, 19th century. And the beginning of the move towards drugs was actually really pushed by how do we make these foul tinctures taste better? Um, which is a really good question, but that's... <laughs> Now it's how can we make it standardized so that the, the regulators are going to agree that our product is of the right quality. It's not quality that they're talking about. They're talking about chemical volume. Quality to me is the quality of the outcome and that's not being measured. So we need to feel confident in our tradition and strong in the tradition and not be intimidated um, by white coats, PhDs, or FDA agents. Though they, they're good at intimidation. Um, I should just say, I'm, I'm one of the very few people in the herb world who actually supports the FDA. I think they're doing an essential job. They're doing it really badly when it comes to herbs. <laughs> but I have to say, I don't trust the... Um, the bulk of the larger herb industry. They lie to us, they rip us off, and unless you're into analyzing every tablet that you get your hands on, you don't know if you're getting good stuff. Then because that part of the industry is not self-policing, there needs to be an agency. Now, I'm not, in, I'm not including companies that are run by herbalists. They're very different. I'm, I'm, I'm blaming capitalism again. So one last thing to talk about there. Something, a theme that's come up a number of times so far in this conference has is, is been research. And I'm now very deeply involved in a number of research projects where a group of us as herbalists are advising um, medical schools in the formulation of, of their research protocols because there's now a bunch of money available for accredited institutions to do research on complementary medicine. In terms of the research funds for everything else, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a but in terms of not having any grant money, there's a vast amount of grant money around. So lots of schools 
are writing grants to do studies on, on not just herbalism, a whole range of different things. And they're usually terrible, really good grants because they're professional grant writers, but they don't get the herbalism or they don't get the acupressure or they, they don't really understand the ins and outs of, of the therapy that they're looking at. What they do understand is how to run a double blind um, placebo controlled trial, which is something that we don't understand. That's a real skill. So I'm suggesting that we all be available one way or another to be part of these research programs. And actually they're starting to look for us. You don't have to put a, an ad in the paper. But the point I'm really wanting to make is that we should be doing socially relevant research. It doesn't make sense to me, A, to do research to prove that a herb works. It, that's not the issue. Um, the herb either works or it doesn't work for a whole range of reasons, statistics not being one of them. So. I'm not interested in that sort of research. I'm not in interested in comparing outcomes of um, mainstream treatments with outcomes of herbal treatments. What I'm really interested in at the moment is facilitating res research which is going to get the use of herbs into institutions, into general awareness. And acknowledging the capitalist nature of healthcare, the way you do that is to show hospital administrators that you can save them money. And if you can save them money, they'll do anything, yeah. basically. So I'm um, involved now in a company called uh, Traditional Medicinals that makes herb teas. Um, very high quality herb teas, but as a clinician, I would never actually really expect a herb tea to do very much because I've been trained in the use of tinctures. Since observing what is going on in, in these studies, I'm actually changing my mind. Um, it's amazing what you can achieve with a, with a good tea. But we've just finished one study at, um, oh, I forgot, the, it's Cedarbrook, I can't remember where it is, somewhere on the East Coast. Um, an old, well, in England they're called old people's home, homes. Um, population of people from 70 to 90 something. Um, and we were able to show, using their statisticians, their doctors, their nurses, their people doing all the work, that the use of Senna tea regularly not only alleviated the constipation, it reduced the amount of drugs that were being used, reduced the amount of stool softeners that were being used, reduced the amount of time nurses had to spend with with each um, patient doing you know, that major sort of care. I'm not wanting to reduce the amount of time nurses spend with patients, but um, it was really clear cut. The use of very simple, very available herbs was able to um, cut costs uh, basically 15% um, in this one ward. Um, when that paper gets published, it may well be that a whole bunch of um, elder facilities in the country start using Senna or Cascara or something in, in the right form. Um, which brings me back to Veriditas. I actually don't really care whether the, the physicians are going to use a herb or a drug. What's important there is the outcome for the patient. But what I do care about is the introduction of green energy into people and into places where there is no green energy. Because about the only thing I think we can really trust at the moment is Veriditas. Everything else is up for grabs. So getting these sorts of teas in, uh, one we're working on at the moment is using decongestant teas in an elderly population, doing quality of life measurements. Not trying to show that you can outdo um, antibiotics, because it's beside the point. That's, no one's going to work on that one. But if you can show that by drinking a tea, you can improve quality of life, then you improve quality of life. And what more can we ask for? I have to, we're running out of time. I've got to bring this to an end. So there's a bunch of issues that I think are, are up, which are 
threatening, potentially concerning, but on the other hand, a real gift of an opportunity to get some insights and transcend it. But I have to put this in a, in a broader context now. Um, I think it's time as a community that we prepare for the worst, whether it be you know, the earthquake in Northern California, whether it be more hurricanes, um, whether it be a fascist takeover, doesn't matter. The time is coming very soon where the cultural availability of healthcare is going to start breaking down. And there's one really clear reason why this is going to happen. Um, 70 to 80 percent of all prescription medications are manufactured from petrochemicals. And even the ones that aren't manufactured from petroleum, they're distributed by petroleum. Um, the petroleum, according to some analyses, the petroleum runs out in 12 years, which means it's going to be the price is going to go through the roof again. If you, if you ever go to Europe, you'll know what petrol really should cost. <laughs> it's subsidized here. Um, <coughs> We're rapidly moving into a situation where the social safety net doesn't exist and the only people who get the drugs and get the quality health care that Americans think they have a right to, in which case, why didn't Clinton's health... All right, I'll, I'll leave that one. <laughs> Coming from the evils of European socialism, I just don't understand why you put up with all of this. But Very soon, only the rich will be able to afford it. And it's going to get very, very messy. And overnight, we're suddenly going to become a solution. Because all the pharmacists will remember the doctors won't but the pharmacist will remember that there are things growing in the hedgerow which somebody once told them were antiseptic. We're going to be the only coherent source of um, the knowledge needed to be able to use natural medicine en masse to actually alleviate suffering. But that's going to be a different sort of herbalism to tincture-based herbalism, to um, you know, high-quality, extreme protocol development for rare dangerous diseases, or, or just dangerous diseases, not just, just rare ones. This is actually going to be a re reassert, reassertion of people's medicine. The core heart and soul of herbalism doesn't need cleverness. It just needs a willingness to get into the fields and then do stuff with what you find in the fields. Most of us went through botany education in school where they made a big point of letting you know what was going to kill you out there. You know, the poisonous plants, the dangerous plants. I've, I've got a, a book at home which is a, um, oh, I, I still don't know American school grades, but for 10, 12 year olds, introduction to, you know, wild plants and what you can do with them. The first half of the book is all about the deadly poisons. It's all about how you've got to be really careful out there. And no, we don't. Um, we have to be really careful in here, crossing the streets, turning the TV on. Um, so whether you are concerned about natural disasters because of the because of global warming or whether you're concerned about um, fascist takeover the herbal response is the same doesn't matter we need to be ready to um, help our colleagues in the healthcare field the doctors the nurses the pharmacists the acupuncturists everybody we're going to be the source of the the core source of the, the healing material this doesn't mean you should all buy stocks in nature's way. <laughs> it means give away your knowledge. Share the plants. Be free with that knowledge just the way the plants are free with us. Now, growing up in England, 
I, I was surrounded by the stench of rotting empire. This was in the 60s. The English empire was long gone, but you could smell it. You know, evil, massive military thing. Um, and when I came, escaped from Thatcher and came to this country, living in Northern California, it wasn't there. I, that, that energy wasn't there. However, it's back. I'm really primed to detect it. All my father's family died in, in the gas chambers. And I just have this family experience of what the men in the jackboots actually get up to. It doesn't matter whether they're on your side or somebody else's side. Once you put somebody in a military uniform, their humanity goes out of the window. They do what they're told, and they're being told some really disgusting stuff. So I'm very concerned over the last two years, just watching what's been going on, because from my European experience, um, I give us two more years before they're actually on the streets. Have you noticed the last few months, Bush's response to um, Katrina, to natural disaster, the military. Yeah. Bush's response to the flu pandemic, the military. And that was another one. But, you know, that's the response. And we can trust them. They're the military. Um, <laughs> there was a concept in Europe you might be familiar with about the good German, the person in the 30s who just sort of let it happen. That's where we are now. Don't be a good American. So I've gone way over time. What this would lead to is, for example, we could very easily come up with a bioregional guide. You know, each area of the country does this. The herbalists in that area do this. What are the abundant local antiseptics? The abundant local demulcents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very easy to do. Um, however, it would mean giving away our knowledge. And there's still some resistance to do that. But I think we should be getting ready to do this. And another thing that I'm, I'm actually going to be working on for the Guild, and it should be up and running quite soon, I'm wanting to get a website together where clinicians from the Guild and, and other herbal skilled clinicians um, contribute their flu protocols. Because I'm really concerned about the flu. I don't have no idea whether any of our stuff is going to work. We can't know. It's a new mutation. I mean, you know all of this stuff. It's the epitome of the place where um, rip-off artists and true believers are going to be talking complete bullshit about what herbs are going to save the nation. I mean, you, you know what I mean. You know what goes on. And I think it's really important that we actually freely share information with each other and therefore anybody else who wants to log on to it um, to see what we would do not what the product pushers would do. Um, let me give you an example of why I really don't know what to do. Um, Lamatium dissectum seems to have a lot going for it based on what happened in, in the 1918 pandemic. The Washoe Indians got the flu, but they didn't die. They were using Lamatium. But then you read closely, and it was basically a pound of Lamatium turned into what must have been really difficult to drink decoctions, but a pound a day. And actually, from my experience of lamation, that would kill off anything. <laughs> but the implication there is that we haven't a chance in hell of using that in a socially usable way. There isn't that much lamation. But I think we need to start thinking about those things, talking about those things. Um, and definitely don't let the uh, oh, don't let the mainstream lie to people about herbs, and don't let the um, the capitalists feed off the herbs when it comes to something as crucial as healthcare in a flu pandemic. So I'm going to stop there.
but I'm going to stop with a poem. And it's, I didn't write it, so you're all right. <laughs> um, it's by Wendell Berry. And I want to be Wendell Berry when I grow up. <laughs> and I have no idea what the name of this poem is. It, it was in a book called um, Earth Prayers. And it starts with three dots. And the implication is it's, it's taken out of another poem. And there wasn't a title. So I haven't been able to find it in his, his core writing. So. so, friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone that does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag and hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all that which you cannot understand. Let me reread that one. I got that all wrong. Give your approval to all that you cannot understand. Praise ignorance, for what man has not encountered, man has not destroyed. <laughs> Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest you did not plant and that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into mold and call that profit. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chatterings of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. And laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, although you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, praise women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? And as soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the fool's trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction, and practice resurrection. Thank you. Thank you.